I'm going to read verses 21 to 26. Not so much to do an exposition from it as that would not be possible in the time remaining, but use it as an exhortation to get you thinking about the gospel in color, in red, white, and blue. Follow along as I read. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. What have we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. May the Lord help us to see the gospel again today, to rejoice in the gospel, but also to grow in appreciation at the impact the gospel has had throughout the centuries in the shaping of nations, even this nation. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, you're probably wondering, preacher, what's on your mind to announce a sermon entitled The Gospel in Red, White, and Blue? Let me tell you what's not. This is not going to be a sermon about how the American flag drapes around the cross of Jesus Christ. It's not going to be a sermon about how how America is the new Israel of God. It's none of those things. What I hope to show you historically today and exhort you biblically to see is that there's a reason that our flag has in its colors red, white, and blue. And it goes back uh, to the very Holy of Holies in the Old Testament and was carried forward in nation building one of the things I would challenge you to do when you have an opportunity is just look, look at the flags of Europe and see that several of them incorporate the colors red, white, and blue. And there's a reason for that, and I, I came across an article where uh, someone who was head of the... Uh, of naval records at the United States Navy Department said this, the flag, talking about the flag of the United States of America, may trace its ancestry back back to Mount Sinai, where the Lord gave to Moses the Ten Commandments and the Book of the Law, which testify of God's will and man's duty, which commandments were deposited in the Ark of the Covenant within the tabernacle, whose curtains were blue, purple, scarlet, which is red, and fine twined linen, which is white. Before the ark stood the table of showbread with its cloth of blue, scarlet, and white. These colors from the Hebrew tabernacle were taken over by the church in the West and given to many nations in Europe as their flags. Two should come to mind quickly. The Union Jack of Great Britain, France, red, white, and blue. We could argue that France is an almost completely secular nation today and Britain is headed that way and may become a Muslim nation before it comes com- becomes completely secular. But their history is undeniable. And it's striking to me, folks, that when America was going th- for its independence, to make a clean break with Britain. Our founding fathers could have designed flags in any number of colors. 
but they took the colors red, white, and blue. Now, as far as the flag goes, and Linda was kind enough to print up some color sheets for our children, which tell about the colors in the flag. Red is for courage, zeal, fervency. White is for purity, cleanness of life, and rectitude of conduct. Blue is for loyalty, devotion, friendship, justice, and truth. That's, that's what the flag represents today in popular uh, culture. The star is an ancient symbol of dominion and sovereignty. It was the kings from the ancient east who spotted a star and followed it to where the young child lay. And so we have this background. I just will show it just real quickly. Exodus 25, 3 and 4. When, when the Lord said to Moses, tell the people I want a contribution. We're going to build a tabernacle. And this is the contribution that you shall receive from them, gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet yarns, and fine twined linen and goat's hair. And it goes on for description. Exodus 26, verse 1. Moreover, you shall make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine twined linen. There's your white. And blue and purple in the... In the Commentators on the Hebrews seem to say that, that it's speaking of a, a bluish purple and scarlet yarns. You shall make them with cherubim skillfully worked into them. Verse 36, you shall make a screen for the entrance of the tent of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen embroidered with needlework. And so you had this woven into this color scheme that met them at many points in their tabernacle worship. One writer observed that about once every decade, our nation's birthday, July the 4th, coincides with the Lord's Day. It falls on Sunday. Historically, those Sundays, you may not know this, uh, have been known as Red, White, and Blue Sunday. Not out of some misguided hyper-patriotism, but because of an understanding of the background to the colors in our flag. You may recall 1976, which was the 200th anniversary of our nation, that it fell on a Sunday, July the 4th did. A day to celebrate freedom. Still, the freest nation on the face of the earth. And so here's a poem that someone wrote to celebrate old glory. Here's to the red of it. There's not a thread of it, no, not a shred of it, in all the spread of it from foot to head, but heroes bled for it, faced steel and lead for it, precious blood was shed for it, bathing it red. Here's to the white of it, thrilled by the sight of it, who knows the right of it, but feels the might of it through day and night. Womanhood's care for it, made manhood dare for it, purity's prayer for it, kept it so white. Here's to the blue of it, heavenly view of it, star-spangled hue of it, honesty's dew of it, constant and true. Here's to the whole of it, stars, stripes, and pole of it. Here's to the soul of it, red, white, and blue. So where is the gospel in red, white, and blue? Well, if you were to go back through our text, you would see that it's speaking about the righteousness of God, which is necessary. You and I will never be right with God by finding anything in ourselves that we can uh, approach God to give to him that will convince him it's time now to be made right. No, no, we have to have an external righteousness, a righteousness outside of ourselves. And this passage tells us that it's found... When faith, childlike faith, is placed in Jesus Christ. And it's apart from keeping the law because we're all lawbreakers in God's sight. Faith in Jesus Christ. It's called justification. Justification. To be forgiven of our sin and accepted as righteous in God's sight. Not for anything we have done or could do 
but only exclusively for who Jesus Christ is, what he came to do, and the reality of that, the power of that applied to us by God's grace through faith in him. That's the gospel. The text says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And, and so you, you see these, these statements here, and you cannot help but be reminded Isaiah 1, 18. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, red represents our sins. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. White the cleansing that comes through the work of Jesus. Though they're red like crimson, they shall become like wool. So I want you to just see for just a, a few minutes. When we think of the color red and when it's used in flags, if you trace it back far enough historically, it anchors itself in man's problem. Man has a sin problem. We're born into this world with a sin problem problem. Someone has said that red is easily seen. You've, you've seen, if, if you want to get a bull's attention, wave red at him. A red car is easily seen, but it also easily attracts the attention of law enforcement if it's going faster than the speed limit. The British had their, they were the red coats, and they were easily spotted by our guerrilla patriots in the battle for independence. The scarlet letter hung around the neck of an adulteress so that all would see here is an adulteress. So red is a color that speaks of the reality of our sins, our need. We're desperate we're rejected by God based upon our sin nature and our sinful actions. But it also, red plays a double meaning here. It also is the blood of Jesus. It's by the blood of Jesus that we can be washed white as snow. Red clears the crimson red of our sins. Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, that is, our human depravity that's universal, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Hebrews 9, 14, 15, How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. In Hebrews 9.22, you're familiar with, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. Red represents our sins and Jesus' blood to atone our sins. White, white washes away. Listen to the psalmist. Purge me with hyssop, Psalm 51, 7. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. There again, that, that strange imagery. If you're washed in the blood of the Lamb, we have a hymn we sing about, are you washed? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? and you're made whiter than snow. Revelation 3, 4, and 5 says, Yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who've not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. It's the image of, of moving through, not only clothed in the robes of the righteousness of Jesus Christ in justification, but walking and growing in grace in sanctification. These in Sardis who've not soiled their garments, who've not compromised with the world, and he says, they will walk with me 
in heaven in white. There's glorification. The imagery of white as being purified, delivered from sin. One fellow told a story about a Christmas when they had all red lights on their tree. And at the bottom of the tree, as they were, as they were trimming the tree and decorating it, they had some poinsettias. Some were red, some were white. He said when they got ready to, to see the tree in all its grandeur, they turned off all the lights except their lights on the tree. And he said he noticed something interesting, that in the poinsettia, even with all the red lights, the red leaves of the poinsettia appeared to be white. They took on white. And then blue. Blue can symbolize, as some have suggested, water baptism, uh, that we're, we're, we're washed symbolically when we're plunged beneath uh, the cleansing flood as we sing, victory in Jesus. It certainly can mean that, the cleansing symbolically that takes place when we're plunged into water. But it also, by virtue of the stars uh, on, the, on the blue field, uh, speaks of heaven. When you look up, to the heavens, your redemption draws nigh. We speak of God being in the heavens. Paul promises the Ephesians, you've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And so, so this blue background with the star field promises us that if we've been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ, washed white as snow, living with the white garments of the righteousness of Christ, making our way to heaven, heaven will be our home. It is the final resting place. Matthew 24, 30, because it can also speak of, of the second coming of Christ. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he'll send out his angels with a loud trumpet. They'll gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now, what I would like for you to do is think more creatively. There's a, there's a backlash taking place in this country that is good. There's a swelling of, of thanksgiving and gratitude for America, recognizing God made America great. And as, as one person who traveled here and wrote about America, uh, de Tocqueville said, God is, America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, then America will cease to be great. And there's a clash going on, and, I'm, I'm, and I've told you about this recently. We've talked about the culture wars. But I've had friends who are only acquaintances now who have this subtle anti-American um, we owe everybody, everywhere, everything mentality. And it undermines. And so people today, people today spit upon the flag, trample upon the flag, burn the flag. I think it's wrong, but for the time being, it's within the First Amendment possibilities. But I want us to use this to see that there's a background to this flag. There's a gospel background. I'm not naive. I would not tell you that America was formed by Christians. It was formed by some who were Christians, some who were deists, some who were Unitarians. That's the facts. But there was definitely a Judeo-Christian influence cast all over everything about the founding of this nation. Our Declaration of Independence, our Constitution, our Bill of Rights. You cannot deny the Christian influence that founded America. And I believe it's only as long as that influence continues that we have any reason to hope that God will continue to bless America. One of our missionaries was asked on the foreign fields decades ago now, what's the first thing you pray for when you rise in the morning? He said, I pray that God will keep America strong and that the influence of Jesus Christ will continue to prevail because we know out here on the fields that if America goes down, much of international mission work goes down 
with it. And so thank God for your heritage. Thank God for the gospel. Seize the opportunity when you're around somebody that's waving a red, white, and blue flag to share the background to that and to inject the gospel into it. In a revival of patriotism, you need to be careful because there will be those who will, who will make the two the same, and they're not. I told you years ago, I'm a Christian who happens to be an American. I'm not an American who happens to be a Christian, but I thank God for that heritage. And then one thing I want to say to close, there was a little controversy this year, this week, about Betsy Ross's flag. You may have read about it. I'll give you a little background to that. Betsy Ross, you may know or may not know, was a Quaker. In 1776, that, that year ought to ring with you if you have any American history about you at all, Quakers were prohibited from owning slaves. And 14 years later, 1790, they petitioned the U.S. Congress for the abolition of slavery. Quakers led the move. As a primary Quaker belief is that all human beings are equal and worthy of respect. The fight for human rights has also extended to many other areas of society, including abortion. Betsy Ross stitched a flag and didn't have any idea that the flag would or should represent slavery. Her worldview was opposed to slavery. But in case you haven't seen, I want to put a picture of the flag up there and just see what the symbolism was behind the flag. The circle of stars represents eternity. The blue backdrop, vigilance, perseverance, justice. The red stripes, hardiness and valor. The white stripes, purity, innocence. And there were 13 stripes for what were then the 13 colonies. Folks, be wise. Don't let people make you ashamed of your heritage. Are there sins? Yes. Is there forgiveness when we repent of sins? Yes. Should we hold one another's sins over our heads once we've repented and been forgiven? No. No. Don't buy the lies being sold today. America is great because God made America good. And as followers of Jesus Christ, who live to preach the gospel and make disciples, we should shine the light of truth. Gospel truth, historical truth, and not be cowed down by those who want to use pejorative terms to label us. The light which you and I have shines in the darkness. And darkness has never been able to put out the light. The only thing that causes darkness to appear to overcome light is when light withdraws. We're going to be looking at this in 1 Corinthians next week, Lord willing. To stand fast, behave like adult followers of Christ. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, we bow before you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we thank you for this day. We thank you for the heritage, and we can look all the way back into the Holy of Holies, which held the Ark of the Covenant, and see colors that had meaning, and still today have meaning. We thank you, Lord, that we live in a land, though very imperfect, and filled with sin and rejection of you that still has a core, still has a foundation, though crumbling, of your influence, the Judeo-Christian influence. Help us, Lord, to raise children who are wise and who don't buy the lies being perpetrated 
uh, in classrooms and in Congress and on the media and in print. But go to the sources, discover our history, and then as Paul said to the Ephesians, having done all, to stand in the whole armor of God, withstanding the fiery darts of the evil one. We thank you for your providence in placing us here. And to the extent that we as a people strive to bless you and bless others, we pray, dear God, bless us. But we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and